It's good to see everybody on this great morning. The last two services were a little quiet. <laughs> but sometimes it's difficult to get up and go in on these kind of rainy, dreary days. For instance, this morning, my alarm went off, and I forgot it was Sunday. <laughs> Every weekday, my alarm goes off at 5.30, and I hear my daughter's alarm, and I get up, and I go downstairs to do my devotions, spend some time with the Lord, and set the tone for the house and get my directions for the day. Or at least that's what I'm supposed to do. But how many of us know that sometimes when we're tired or it's rainy out, and the alarm goes off, and we think, meh. <laughs> well, that was me this morning. The only problem was that it wasn't a weekday, it was Sunday. Thank God that Sassy texted me because the moment I looked at my phone, I was like, oh my gosh. And I jumped up and I hopped in the shower and I was running around trying to get ready and now I was stressed. Why am I telling you this, you're wondering? Because if we allow what we see around us or our feelings to dictate what we do, it's gonna stress us out and it's gonna lead us astray every single time. My directions or getting my directions doesn't start when I open my Bible. My first direction is to get out of bed when the alarm goes off, to start speaking to God when I open my eyes. Because when I do, the rest of my day is a smooth ride. And even when it isn't, I have the confidence in whom I belong to. Amen. Father, we thank you for this time together to hear your word. May we listen and ponder it. Thank you for speaking life to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. In 1999, July 16, 1999, John F. Kennedy Jr. died when his airplane he was flying crashed into the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. Isn't it hard to believe that was almost 20 years ago? For those of us that remember it, there's some who weren't born 20 years ago in the room. But the official investigation by the National Transportation Safety Board concluded that Kennedy fell victim to spatial disorientation while he was descending over water at night and consequently lost control of his plane. Kennedy did not hold an instrument rating and therefore was only certified to fly under visual flight rules. At the time of the crash, the weather and light conditions were such that all basic landmarks were obscured, making visual flight challenging although legally still permissible. Isn't that funny? He actually shouldn't be doing this, but he legally could do it. Sound like society today? There's things that we shouldn't be doing, although legally permissible, okay? Watch this. Spatial disorientation, because I had no idea what that meant. In aviation, I had to go talk to Colonel Biggin between each service. I messed up this story both services, so I had to go talk to Colonel Biggin. Uh, he's an uh, Air Force pilot here in the church, so I had to get all my facts straight. In aviation, the term means the inability to correctly interpret the aircraft's attitude, altitude, and airspeed in relation to the ground or a point of reference. And a lot of times they cannot figure this out once their point of reference is lost. This was the part that got me. Ready? Spatial disorientation is a condition in which the aircraft pilot's perception of direction does not agree with reality. They think they're going in the right direction, but reality is they are not. Or they think they're going in the wrong direction, but in reality they're going in the right direction, right? What they feel is not reality. What they feel is not reality. Here at Family Church we say, your feelings or doing something based on your feelings is probably the stupidest thing we could do, right? Because feelings change. It's a temporary condition. The spatial disorientation is a spatial con uh, temporary condition resulting from fl uh, flight into poor weather conditions or low visibility. Under these conditions, the pilot may be deprived of an external visu visual horizon, which is critical to maintaining the correct sense of up and down while flying. And as I was studying how best to close out this series on what would Jesus undo, I began to think about this spiritual meh 
this spiritual indifference, this spiritual whateverness. Uh, and where does it come from, and why do we see it impacting the local church in such a strong way today? And last week we ran out of time as I was telling you how to combat spiritual indifference or spiritual laziness or spiritual slumber or spiritual meh. And I let you know this. I said the, there's one thing that we can begin to do is do something each day that requires faith. I threw that out there. Each day, do something that requires faith. But I didn't have time to unpack that. What I am not saying is do something that requires huge amounts of faith that you don't have. I'm saying do something every single day that requires some faith, okay? So get, let me give you some examples. Maybe you need to stand up for what you believe in, even though you know you're going to get dogged for it. I did jury duty a few years ago. Anybody ever done jury duty? That is like Satan's paradise. Let me tell you right now. We were on a drunk driving case, and I got picked for the case, and I was there for like three weeks of my life that I will never get back. Um, I, didn't, I didn't appreciate I didn't enjoy the, the, the system and how it worked. Um, so it come, we, three weeks we sat through all of this, and now we had to deliberate. We had to make our decision. It was 11 against 1. Now you may be saying, well, then that's because you're an idiot. Listen, do you know what people were saying? They were making comments like this. Who cares? Let's just go home. Who cares about this? Who cares about him? Who cares about the situation? Let's just go home. I'm tired. People who were on my side, now we're on the who cares side because they were bullied, they were pressured just to make a decision and just to get out and just to be done with the system. Ended up being a hung jury, so the person had to be tried all over again, and at the end of the whole thing, the, the judge says, hey, what, what did you learn from this judicial system? I said, I learned how to get away with drunk driving. That's what I learned. I learned that the system is broken when you let people who literally could care less, right? But I had to stand, and it was hard, because part of me wanted to give in. Part of me wanted to say, you know what, yeah, who, who cares? No, no, but what's right? What's right? See, if you're going to break out of the meh, then you might have to extend faith and do something that's right in the face of adversity. Maybe you need to, and maybe a step of faith for you would be give when it's hard for you to give. Give when it's a stretch for you to give. And I'm not just talking about like giving to the local church, but wonder if you went into a, um, the diner and uh, you're going in for breakfast and you see somebody sitting there and you feel inside, pay for their breakfast. <laughs> Satan, get behind me. Maybe you walk into the diner and there's a military man sitting there having breakfast and you feel the Holy Spirit tell you, buy them breakfast. Why would I do that? They're fine. But maybe that person was just contemplating, does anybody care about me for the service that I'm giving to my country? Does anybody recognize the sacrifice that I'm making? You know, maybe it's not worth it. I'm done. And your small gift that just says, I'm going to pick up this breakfast for this guy or this girl means the world to them. Yeah, it was a step of faith for you, but it was a life changer for this person. Okay? Maybe, and you're not going to like this one, maybe apologize to somebody, even if you're right. Well, why would I do that? That's why. Because you ain't living happy and you're right. I'd rather be happy and then be wrong, right, than be unhappy and be right. I'm say, listen, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It, it, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I lost my temper. I'm sorry I yelled. You needed to be yelled at. Don't even go there. Just <laughs> maybe forgive when you don't feel like forgiving, okay? That might be a step of faith. Volunteer to pray out loud. Someone needs prayer, pray out loud. You know, I, I find it funny. I told Second Service this. Church prayer many times reminds me of a group of guys walking into the bathroom. Guys, we'll be talking, blah, 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 blah. We walk into the bathroom. 
say nothing. You know, women be in the bathroom. China, hand me some toilet paper. This is my space, bro. Don't get nowhere near me. <laughs> and sometimes I think like, we'll, we'll meet up here sometimes for prayer before service, and we'll get in the circle back. Like, All right, let's pray. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, God. I pray out loud. Right. Here, here at Family Church on staff, uh, we have a prayer model that when someone's leading in prayer, we're not all standing there in agreement. We're praying too. We're praying. We, we know what the topic is. We're going to pray for church today. Now, I just begin to pray out for the service. It's great that someone's leading the prayer, but I want you to pray out what God is leading on your heart. Maybe you pray out something different than I pray out. And maybe it's a step of faith to pray out loud. I'll just throw in, nowhere in the Bible does it say pray in your head. It says with stammering lips and with your lips having to move. Okay. Uh, maybe reach out to someone who God placed on your heart. That's a step of faith. I never want to hear again in my own life, I never want this to happen again, where I get a call that someone passed away and then I say, man, I felt to call them yesterday too. No. No. That ain't going to happen. Because if I think of somebody... If someone's on my heart, if someone pops into my head, for no reason, why am I thinking about this person? Send them a text message. Call them on the phone, all right? You don't know why you just started thinking about that person. But that might be a step of faith to break you out of your funk, your spiritual selfishness, and step into someone else's life, right? Um, how, when's the last time you prayed for something that was impossible, When's the last time you prayed for something that was physically, humanly impossible? See, that will break the barriers of spiritual meh. When's the last time you attempted to do something that you could never do without God's help? Exactly. It would break some spiritual meh. And we're talking about faith here, doing something that requires faith. Hebrews eleven six 6 tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So this week, I want to look at why it's hard to have faith, why it's hard to have faith, why it's hard to trust God, and why it's so easy to be meh spiritually, all right? And this is what I found. Many Christians are flying blind. Many Christians are flying blind. Just like JFK, he had some hours, he had like 300 hours of flying time. He felt he was prepared for the storm in the life in front of him. So he took the plane up into the air. And a lot of Christians just have not taken the time to prepare themselves for the storms that are going to hit Christian, Christian lives. Right? We're flying blind. We don't know what our instruments are supposed to be reading. And we've lost sense of the horizon. We've lost sense of landmarkers that are out in front of us. It's hard to have faith when we don't know what true faith looks like. I was raised in a generation of the TV evangelist. Anybody in that age, the TV evangelist? You remember when TBN was at its peak, and you go on there and you watch these TV evangelists, and they get on stage, and they'd wave a towel, and 10,000 people would fall down on the ground. And, and when we find out that they were all healed of cancer, right? Is that real faith? Is that true faith? And, and, then, and then they would come forward and, and he would lay hands or, or somebody would lay hands on him and we would hear their testimonies. But then we would find out later that they were paid actors. So we lost our faith in a person of faith. And so then we don't know what does true faith look like. Is faith when someone's healed? Like did that person have real faith because now they were healed? When the Bible says that healing is the children's bread, that healing is a right, it's not a result of having more faith or not enough faith. We don't know what true faith looks like, so how can I recognize it when I see it? What is true faith? I believe that the church today has lost sight of some important landmarks that God placed in this world and God placed in our lives to let us know we were on course. You see, JFK was flying over water at night. 
in, a cloudy, in cloudy conditions. He couldn't simply look down and see house lights. And maybe if he did see house lights, were those house lights or were they stars? See, he had lost landmarks. He, he, he lost, what is this thing actually supposed to look like? And I think in the church today, it's kind of the same thing has happened. Because everything in the world is now permissible, we don't know what does this thing look like. What is it, what's a Christian supposed to look like? What's a Christian marriage supposed to look like? What are Christian kids supposed to look like? What is this life supposed to look like? Are we right side up or are we upside down? Are, are, are we on course or have we drifted off course? You see, JFK was not IFR. He was not instrument flight rated. He was VFR. He was visually flight rated. He had to fly by landmarks having a clear visual horizon. Okay? Now, if you've ever gone out to the beach, you could look out at the ocean and you could see where the blue water stops and the blue sky begins. But at night, in a cloudy conditions, 12,000 feet, he would have lost that perspective. Right? I see that in the world today, all of our landmarks of what's right and wrong are skewed. Life today is just fuzzy and cloudy and hazy. And the landmarks of what's right and what's wrong are all jacked up. It's as if whoever has the most money gets to decide what's right and wrong. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm just going to throw it out there. Don't hate me for this. But just because something's legal doesn't make it biblically right. I'm, I'm sorry. It just doesn't. Right? We don't know what's right and wrong. We are so disoriented, and please don't hate me for this, but we're so disoriented in society today that our babies don't know what gender they were born. We're disoriented. And I mean, it used to be easy. The doctor pulled them out, smacked them on the butt, says, you're having a girl. You're having a boy. Now it's, hey, hey, hey. Don't identify what my child is. Let them figure it out on their own. Train up a child in the way they should go. So when they're old, they'll still be steady. They'll still be alert. They'll still be flying in the proper direction. But when we give no direction to our children, and we give no direction to our society, and we give no direction to our families, we're flying blind. And we don't know what direction, what's right. What's true north? What's my heading? What's my bearing? What am I supposed to be when I grow up? Listen, moms and dads, you should be teaching this to your kids, what they should be. If your kid can't sing, don't tell them they're going to be a singer. Two things my parents always knew about me. I talked a lot. All right? Michael McKelvey is a pleasure to have in class. He just talks too much. So they knew I was going to use my big mouth for something. Whatever it was. I was either going to be a school teacher or some kind of instructor or a politician. Whatever it was, I was going to talk a lot. Secondly, my mom and dad would buy me a Christmas gift and by the end of the day, I had it taken apart into a million pieces. And then I'd put it back together. And I knew how to put it back together. So they knew I was going to do something with my hands. So don't sign me up for accounting classes. <laughs> Just don't do it. I was in special needs reading, almost all schooling, special needs reading. I mean, I, middle school and high school, I was in special needs reading. I don't even know if my parents remember this, because it was like, it was embarrassing to me. I couldn't read. But I could take anything apart and put it back together. I could take a motor apart and put it back together. I could take a clock apart and put it back together, right? And I'm watching my son, and it's aggravating to me that we will sit there for hours and put the Lego mansion together. <laughs> I'll walk away, and within five minutes, it's in pieces. <laughs> awesome. 
He's smart with his hands, and he knows how to put them back together. Train up a child in the way that they're naturally soaring, in the way that they're naturally flying. See it. Take the time to understand what your kids are good at, okay? Look at the landmarks in their life. I'm, I'm not trying to offend you today, but today we don't know if we're right side up or if we're upside down. Because the landmarks in life have become fuzzy. The landmarks in life have become cloudy. Watch this. In 2 Corinthians 5, 6, Paul writes this to us. He goes, therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in this body, we are away from the Lord. Okay, obviously, we're not in heaven with him, right? We're here on earth. Watch what he says this. For we live by faith and not by sight. We live by faith not by the landmarks of what society says. We live by faith in God, not by what other people say we should do or what other people say is right or wrong. Watch. He goes, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and home with the Lord. Ready? Watch this. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. I wonder when the last time you considered what pleases God when you made a decision for your life. When's the last time in whatever you were going to spend your money on, you said, I wonder if this purchase pleases God. Or how many of us said, who cares? That's what I want to do. <laughs> Meh. Is this pleasing to God what I'm doing? I don't care. It's what I want. It's what I want. I had a conversation the other day, student, and uh, some things were going on. I said, now you realize this decision that you're making does not line up with the biblical truth of Christianity. Like the decision that you're making right now, this is not what we believe as a church. You know what they said? I don't care. Raise your church your whole life. I don't care. It's what I want. This is what I want. It's what feels good to me. It's what feels right. See, the, the problem with spatial disorientation and what happened with JFK, it felt right. It felt like he was flying the right way, but he had already begun to drift sideways. He couldn't tell if his attitude was horizontal or if he had become vertical because what he saw looked right and it felt right. But if he knew his instruments, if he knew the instruments on his dashboard, if Christians knew what the word of God said, if they knew what the voice of the Holy Spirit was saying, if they knew the indicators, wah, 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 don't do this. It wouldn't matter what we feel because I'm not moved by what I see. I'm moved by the faith of the Son of God that's inside of me. This decision that I'm making, I want to please God with it. What I'm doing with my life, I want to please God with it. Right? Without faith, we're going to live the meh life. Have we lost the landmarker called the desire to please God? Well, God will forgive me, so does it matter. And that's meh. It, it, it's, not, it's not condemnation to say, hey, we should want to please God. That's not condemnation. That's not legalism. That's, that's, a, that's a duty of relationship. In your marriage, you should desire, hello, somebody to please each other. That's a good marriage if you ask me, right? Like I told my wife, don't ask me what I want for lunch anymore. Don't ask me what I want for lunch anymore. Here's five things that I love. I love these five things for lunch. Just magically have one of those five things appear when it's lunchtime. And I'll be surprised and I'll be happy. Ow, oh, this is my favorite lunch ever. <laughs> Put that in place because that's what pleases me. I hate having to think. Mm, what am I in the mood for today? Mm, right? Have we, do we have that landmarker out in front of us that says, this is what's pleasing to God? See, this is what Jesus is talking about in Revelation 3. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one. 
I wish you were cold because cold serves a purpose. I wish you were hot because hot serves a purpose. But lukewarm, dirty water serves no purpose. He says this. He goes, you say with your mouth, I'm good. I'm rich. I've got everything I need. I don't need anything else. He goes, but what you don't realize is that you're flying upside down. See, this is what happened with JFK Jr. He thought that he was flying straight, but his plane had begun to drift. It felt right. He thought he was in control. He had it. I mean, he had to get to the wedding, right? He, had, he was urgent. I got to get to this wedding. I can't wait. I got to get to my destination. And what he didn't realize was that his plane had already begun to drift. And so as, and he's seeing his, his, he's seeing the plane speed up, but his altitude drop. And, and, and so he knows, okay, I got to give it more throttle, and I got to pull back on the stick. I got to bring this thing back up. But he had already turned. He was already off course. His attitude was already jacked up. So the more he pulled back on it, the faster it began to dive. So as he's pulling up, he's actually going down. And this is what Jesus is saying. You think you got it right. You think you're looking at the horizon, but you're upside down. You're upside down. You're looking at the wrong way. Let me be your source. He goes on to verse 19. He goes, those whom I love, I correct and discipline. Those whom I love, I correct and discipline. Or I rebuke and discipline. And this passage here, it's talking more about a gentle correction and discipline to get back on track. So I was teaching a teenager, when I was a youth pastor, I was teaching a teenager to drive, which was one of the scariest moments of my life. We're driving down the road, we're doing about 45 miles an hour, and I asked the individual who was learning to drive, "Um, do you see the sign? Yes, what does it say? 15 mile an hour curve ahead. 15 mile an hour hairpin curve, right? It's, just, it's like a, almost a 90 degree curve. 15 miles an hour. I said, okay. Now, we're beginning to approach this curve. Oh, wait, wait. What does the speed on the sign say? 15 mile an hour. What does the speed on the sign say? 15. Then why are you doing 45? Hit that curve, going 45 miles an hour. Person just freezes, you know, steering wheel shaking because they're, they're not being able to negotiate the curve at the speed that we're going, right? So the car begins to drift out of lane. JFK's airplane began to drift off course, right? So I didn't, I was hysterical going into this curve. But now, now that we're in this and the car is now in the oncoming traffic lane, it's not time to be hysterical. So I didn't ask permission. I didn't say, may I please have permission to touch your steering wheel? No. I grabbed that junk, just like a little dance move, and I, bam, pulled it back into the lane. Mm, bam. Pulled it back, back, back into the lane. You know, you've had to do that from the, from the passenger side, right? Somebody's doing something, or husband, maybe your wife is driving. She starts doing her lipstick, and like, or, or she's looking at something out the, out, out the window, and the car's, and you go, whoa, hey, hey, whoa, what, wow. I pulled it back into the lane. Whoa, thank you so much for correcting me. See, when correction is done correctly, Thank you for correcting me. You see, whom the Lord loves, he'll correct. And it don't have to be some bow, bow. It can just be, bam, get back. Get back on course. Come on. I'll I'll correct it. I'll bring you back in, right? He says, whom I love, I discipline, I correct. So be earnest and repent, he says. So do what I say and change your thinking. Let's change course. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. 
if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. What would Jesus undo? Jesus would undo the belief that we can do this on our own. He's saying, let me in. I'll be the best, flight pilot, uh, the best fly coach you've ever seen. I will teach you and train you exactly how to handle these conditions. Let me in. I wonder how many of us today have been trying to fly their own life by what they see. I can fly my life by what I see. I'm good. I've built a good company. I've built a good organization. I'm good. I've built a good family. I'm good. I don't need help right now. And he's saying, you don't, you're upside down. Your bills are upside down. Your mortgage is upside down. Your car payment's upside down. You're not good. Your spirit life is upside down. You think everything's okay. You're upside down. He says, you think you're clothed, but you're naked. Your sight is impaired. You're flying incorrectly. You see, the Holy Spirit has to be the instrument by which you are led every single day. Romans 8, 14 says this, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So these are pretty big implications. Leave this up on the screen for a second. Here's some implications here. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they, who are they? Those who are led, right? They are sons of God. So if you are not being led by the Spirit, guess what? You're not a child of God. And if you're not a child of God, God has no requirement to lead you. But for those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. They are children of God. If you are being led by the Spirit of God, you are a child of God. Now, I don't know why they wrote it that way, but it didn't say all those who are children of God are led by the Spirit of God. He said the proof's in the pudding. Let it sink in for a second. Are you actually being led by the Spirit of God? That is a landmark to let you know if you're heading in the right direction. What can I see? What can I see that's correctly telling me? Am I doing the Christian life right? A landmark says I'm being led by the Spirit of God. See, the Holy Spirit is your compass. He gives direction to your heading. So talk to the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to talk to you. There's three, there's three things that I want to leave you with today. One was this. Do something every day that requires faith. Number two is this. Don't change course if you're already in God's will. Don't change course if you're already in God's will, okay? And this isn't deep theology, but Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to him and he will direct your path or he will make your path straight. What he did not say here is, let somebody else tell you what you should do with your life. He said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Know what is God's called you to do. What is the flight plan that God has created for your life? And don't let somebody else re-script it. I've seen too many people go into churches and somebody prophesy over them. You're called to the ministry. You're called to do this. You're called. And now they change their flight plan. And their life falls apart. I'm going to tell you, this is how God works. Are you ready? When I was 15 years old, I had a vision, a straight-up vision. I've, I've only had three of these my whole life. I had a vision where I saw myself as a grown man. Um, the only incorrect part of the vision was I had hair in the vision, but I could have added that. Um, I saw myself as a grown man on stage in a stadium full of thousands of people. I saw the bright light shining on me and I had a microphone in my hand in a stadium. Now, 
At 15, I did not say, guys, I'm the next Billy Graham. I am supposed to be in stadiums my whole life, traveling the world. Let me change my flight plan and let me pursue stadium ministry. Nope, I didn't do that. I saw it. I had a vision. I knew it was from God, but I put it on the shelf. Four weeks ago, Joel Osteen Ministries called me. They said, hey, Mike, we're going to be in Albany for a night of hope. We'd like to invite you to be part of this with Pastor Joel Osteen. We want you to walk out on stage with him and do a declaration over the Hudson Valley. We want you to be part of this moment. Guess what? I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. I'll tell you straight up, I was so nervous, I couldn't eat all day. That's not really my thing. I'm like a local pastor. Like, that's what I'm called to do. But, hear this. 24 years after having the vision, as I'm flying the flight plan that God designed for me, the phone call comes, now I can recognize a landmark. I can recognize something I saw 24 years ago. And I can say, here's the opportunity. This is the opportunity that I got so many years ago. See, because if God says something to you publicly, it shouldn't be a brand new bombshell. It should just be a confirmation of something he already shared with you in your personal time with him. Now this call comes, I'm like, I recognize this. I saw this happen 24 years ago. So you know what? I'll say yes. I'll take the opportunity in the lifetime of the opportunity. But it wasn't a new idea. I wasn't caught by surprise. Are you seeing what I'm saying here, guys? Don't change the flight plan just because somebody says something. Don't jump at every opportunity if it's not a God opportunity. Number three is this. If you want to break spiritual meh and get on the right flight plan with the Lord, memorize Bible verses. I I can't tell you, I I don't know the last time I even heard the church talk about this. I can't even tell you the last time I heard a single church person say they memorize any Bible verses. When I was a kid, my mama used to pull out three by five index cards, and she would write our Bible verses on it. And before we went to school every day, we had to quote our scriptures. Now, mine happened to be ones like, he who keeps his mouth keeps his life and keeps himself from destruction. (laughs) A soft answer turns away wrath. That the Holy Spirit will bring to my remembrance everything that I studied, because I was failing. But even now... 35 years later, I remember the Bible verses that I put to memory, that we wrote down on those index cards that we did every day. Do you want to break the meh out of your life? Then find some verses that speak to your life in the season that you're in right now. Something you need victory over. Something you need freedom over. Something you need a passion for. Write down those Bible verses and memorize some scripture. And even now I kind of feel... I don't need that. Do do you know what has, do you know the biggest enemy of memorizing Bible verses are, why we don't do it anymore? I don't need to. You don't even know your mama's phone number no more. She's on speed dial number two. Boop. Don't need to know. I don't need to know Bible verse. I'll just Siri it. Honey, you can't Siri the spirit. You can't Siri the Holy Spirit. You can't Siri the direction that God's called you to life. You can't Siri protection over your life. You can't Siri those things. Some of those things just take some work that you put into it in your walk with the Lord. You put some verses to memory. It takes a little bit of work, but guess what? It will break the spiritual meh, the spiritual laziness, the spiritual slumber. And then... When you get to use one of those Bible verses that you memorized, you start looking for opportunities. He's like, yeah, who needs some John 316 right now? I got it ready to go. Oh, hey, hey. 
Who needs some healing right now? Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by his stripes? Bow, bow, bow. You are healed. 1 Peter 2.24. Right? You start looking for those opportunities. You look for it because you know. You know why Christians don't look for opportunities? Because they don't know what they know. You know why Christians hide from Jehovah Witnesses? Because Jehovah Witnesses wipe the floor with you. They don't know the truth, but they know what they believe. <laughs> They'll tear you up with what they believe. They pull out all the to light tower, watch tower, whatever tower. Ba 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 ba. Well, Pastor Mike said John three sixteen. Something about Jesus. It breaks the meh in your life when you do something each day that requires faith. When you stay on the course that God designed for you, and when you memorize some Bible verses that are pertaining to the exact season of your life, it will break the spiritual meh from your life, and it'll put you right back on course. See, JFK... The more he pulled back on the rudder to, 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 to soar higher, as he knew to do what he was supposed to do, he had already fallen off course. So the more he pulled back, the more he dove into the ocean. He never called Mayday. He never set off an alarm because he was in control. He had just gotten this new plane. He was no longer in his Cessna. He had gotten a new plane and and, and in this new plane, he was seated up front all by himself. And his wife and his sister-in-law were in the back seat facing away from him. They were facing the back of the plane, and he's looking out the window. He's up there all by himself. I tell you, don't fly life alone. Because if there was someone in that co-pilot seat that had the same kind of information, they said, hey, 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 we're kind of getting off course here. Hey, 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 I think we're kind of, our attitude's kind of getting out of whack here. Hey, 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 let's, let's write this thing now. In the early stages, let, let's, let's get this thing right right now before we get way off course. See, see, we, we can't be doing this thing on our own. We need to surround ourselves with people that say, hey, 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 let's, let's, let's get a control of this now. If his flight instructor was there who had the experience to fly these sort of things, say, hey, I've been here before. Let me show you how to write this. So if you find yourself in this storm again, you find yourself in this situation again, you'll know what to do. See, this is the walk that we need. As I do these three things, I can step into a place. You know, let me just, can I flow for two more minutes? I'm feeling something. I'm feeling something here this morning because I feel like uh, some, of, some of the people who are a little bit older than me, I'm almost 40, you say, okay, you know, Mike, it's great. Like, you're young and, and, and you got your skinny jeans on and all that kind of stuff. But, <laughs> but what about me? But what about me? I see you bringing younger people into the, to the team and, and you got younger staff. What about me? I would say this, help make room. Help make room for the next generation. It's time to move over. Listen to what I'm saying. It's time to move over and make room. Let the younger now fly, but be their coach. Moms and dads, I mean, we're hearing all this garbage about millennials and blah, 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 blah. I'll tell you, the millennials are some of the most genius generation. But they're also a highly fatherless generation. They're not, they, they, they have been coached. They haven't been made to stick it out. They haven't had the in-depth training. So listen, we're not saying we're done. Heck no, none of you are done. It's just the season's changed. Stop being in control of everything. Move over a seat. Say, hey, sit in a seat. I want to show you what I know. I want to show you how to fix these situations, these problems. In church, it, 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 you're volunteering, you're involved at some place. Who are you showing what you know? Who are you showing what you know? This is how, this is how we're going to reach the kingdom, man. We're going to reach the kingdom of God by, you know what, moving over. I can't wait till I get to move over and have other people doing things that I'm doing, Right? This needs to be the heartbeat of the ministry of God, and this breaks the meh. What about me? What about you?
What are you giving back? What are you giving back to the kingdom? Who are you pouring into? And, you, and when you see yourself pour into somebody's life and it changed their life, it breaks you free from the spiritual indifference. It breaks you free from spiritual slumber. When you see the knowledge that God gave you change someone's life. Amen? Father, we thank you today that we do not have to live spiritually indifferent, that we do not have to live in spiritual slumber, but God, we can be refreshing to those around us. We can bring hope and life to people around us. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit that lives and abides on the inside of us, that we could uh, attune our ear to his voice and watch the instrument panels of our life as the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us. As he corrects our attitude and our altitude and our airspeed, God, we would follow him and he would lead us into truth. If you're here today and you're just like that person that the Bible's talking about, that the Holy Spirit is standing at the door knocking, he's saying, man, my life is all out of whack. I think I've been flying upside down for a long time. I need this Jesus. I need this Holy Spirit that you're talking about today. I need a life change. We do not want you walking out of here today without getting a hold of what you came here for. Do not leave this building today until you get what you came for. If you came here looking for prayer, then don't leave here today without someone praying over you. If you came here today looking for a connection, looking for a hug, don't leave here today without getting what you came here for. And if you came here looking for Jesus... If you came here looking for hope, if you came here looking for life change, then right now is your time. Today's the day of salvation. And here at Family Church, we pray a prayer all together. And if, you, and if you're interested and you need that Jesus, pray this prayer with us. And the family joins in. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I believe that he died on the cross and he rose for me. Jesus, I accept you now into my life to change me and to make me new. I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If that was you, if you prayed that for the first time, would you raise your hand real quick? Anybody in here today? We had seven already today. Anybody else in the back? Anybody else real quick? You say, hey, that's me. I accept you in the back over here in front of the sound booth. Awesome. Praise God. Woo! Amen. Hallelujah. We would ask that if you, if you raised your hand, if you're new here, that you would fill the card out on the seat back in front of you. Uh, just don't rush out of here. Uh, if you accepted Christ or you're new here, you can text Jesus to the number that's on that card or new here to the number that's on that card. And, and stop by one of the tables in the back of the room. If there's anything you need today, if you need prayer, you need a handshake, you need, give me the hug. Uh, but you can... Uh, get everything else in the back. Uh, we have tables set up that we just want to connect with you and let you know we're flying this life with you. Don't fly alone. Find a friend. Find someone. Find a small group to get connected to that you can live this life and have someone else say, hey, let's get back on track. Father, we thank you today for a word in season. That, Lord, we know that we are blessed, but right now we thank you that everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful. We ask you to look down from heaven, smile upon us, be gracious unto us, and give us peace. We thank you for protection and safety as we leave here today. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you.